All right, I'm going to uh, teach on a, something a little bit different uh, tonight. I want to teach on dreams and visions. And, uh, you know, I, I actually have a manual on dreams and visions. I, I so believe in dreams that uh, God had me write a pretty thick manual on dreams and visions. Um, you, you find in Genesis a lot on dreams, and you find in the book of Daniel. Probably the book of Daniel is the most prolific book about dreams and visions uh, that we have in the Bible. And if you'll open up to, to Genesis, the, uh, chapter 37, and when these dreams are really from God, they usually don't just affect the one who dreamed, but there's a person, uh, there's a purpose in what God is doing, and and. In this case, it's extremely evident. Um, let, let me read the text for you. you. You have Genesis 37, 11 verses. It says, Now Jacob dwelt in the land where his father was a stranger, in the land of Canaan. This is the history of Jacob. Joseph, being 17 years old, was feeding the flock with his brothers. And the lad was with the son of Bilhah, and the sons of Zilpah, his father's wives. And Joseph brought a bad report of them to his father. Of who? His brothers. Now Israel loved Joseph more than all his children because he was the son of his old age. Also he made him a tunic of many colors, the coat of many colors. That uh, there, There's even a play that Donny Osmond uh, appeared in uh, on Broadway. But when his brothers saw that their father loved him more than all of his brothers, they hated him and could not speak peaceably to him. Now Joseph had a dream, and he told it to his brothers, and they hated him even more. So he said to them, Please hear this dream which I have dreamed. There we were binding sheaves in the field. Then behold, my sheaf arose and also stood upright, and indeed your sheaves stood all around and bowed down to my sheaf. And his brothers, told, uh, his brothers said to him, Shall you indeed reign over us? Or shall you indeed have dominion over us? So they hated him even more for his dream and for his words. Then he dreamed still another dream and told it to his brothers and said, Look, I have dreamed another dream. And this time the sun and the moon and the eleven stars bowed down to me. Now that was symbolic of the heads of Israel, his father, Jacob. And so now, now he's saying even his father is going to be dependent upon him. That, that he also is going to become subservient to his youngest son. Actually, it was his next to the youngest son. Benjamin was his youngest son. But he seemed to have this affinity for Joseph. Verse 10. So he told it to his father and his brothers, 
And his father rebuked him and said to him, What is this dream that you have dreamed? Shall your mother and I, your brothers, indeed come to bow down to the earth before you? And his brothers envied him, but his father kept the matter in mind. And we, and we know the story of Joseph. They become so enraged. They come this close to wanting to commit murder. One of them restrains the others and said, you know what, let's make a little money on this deal. Let's sell him to slave traders. And if you follow this story in its entirety, you, you understand that due to, the, to a, a famine in that part of the world, the family, Jacob's family, had migrated over into Egypt. They were just, just a family, probably not even a clan yet. And we see that God uses Joseph to salvage and save the family members because of his faithfulness to God. He rises to the second highest level of leadership in the nation of Egypt. And bring, ends up in bringing the entire family group into Egypt under a, a friendly leader at that time, a Pharaoh who was favorable not only to Joseph, because Joseph also interpreted his dreams and saved the entire nation of Egypt from starvation through a divine plan that God showed him. But his own family is also saved. And 400 years later, another Pharaoh turns on an entire nation of people. So that little group of Israelites was incubated, so to speak, under, under the, the uh, leadership of Joseph a family member who is granted favor by the Egyptian leaders and they multiply and multiply and multiply and 400 years, millions left under the leadership of Moses. So God had this divine plan and put it into motion through a dream. So, so Joseph's dream had meaning not only for him, but for others, for the entire nation of Israel. And in a sense, I, and I believe this, I, I believe that there were those at the founding of America who dreamed dreams and had visions. And when you, when you study the history uh, of the founding of America, you see the hand of God bringing us through the revolution. And, and it's amazing, You're, you are talking at that time of the most powerful nation in the world. In England ruled the world. And in the natural, there was no way that we probably could have ever won the Revolutionary War that, that eventually set America free if it hadn't been for the divine intervention of our Heavenly Father, God. In, in Genesis 2.21... It tells of someone who had surgery performed on him while he slept. Can anybody figure out who that was? Hmm? Adam. Yeah. He falls asleep and, and God makes woman. And so, so some interesting things were the result 
of uh, dreams. In Genesis 28, 11 through to 15, it tells of a man who slept at Bethel and dreamed about angels go, scooting up and down ladders. Anybody re remember who that was? Yep, Jacob. So he, Jacob had a, a lot of experience with dreams. And then in Genesis 15, verses 12 through 16, that passage tells us of someone who spoke to Abraham while he was in a deep sleep. Anybody know who spoke to Abraham when he was in a deep sleep? How about God? And, and God cut the Israeli covenant with Abraham, and that's where he promised him a son. And he also reassured Abraham of his promises. There was another man who dreamed. And it's one of the books of the prophets. Speaks of a man who slept in the bottom of a ship as it rolled in a storm. Anybody remember who that was? Jonah. Yeah, Jonah. Jonah. Jonah was running from God. Didn't want to go to Nineveh. The Israelites hated Nineveh. Nineveh was a wicked, wicked empire. Cruel, murderous, torturous. And the last thing Jonah wanted to do was go preach because he knew they'd get saved. And God had to force him through adversity to do what he was called to do. How about Judges, the book of Judges? I'm, I'm just covering some books with you so that you realize God really uses dreams and visions. Judges 16 tells of a man who slept through a haircut, who went into a clip joint and got his haircut. Samson. I, I, I've got a message that I preach, and, it, and, it's, and I entitled the message, Stay Out of Clip Joints. Because he didn't. And we know how he ended up. So a lot of important things can happen to a person while they sleep. But in the Bible, one of the most important things that happened to someone while they slept was that God often gave them dreams. And that was Daniel. Daniel was forever having a dream, or he was being asked to interpret dreams. And so, here in Genesis 37, we have the story of God giving Joseph two wonderful dreams with one basic message. And the message was that one day Joseph was going to be a great man of God. And instead of, of, of making his brothers happy, they, they hated him. Even his father got upset with him. I, I don't know about the wisdom or the timing, but God evidently wanted Joseph to share that dream. He did. And the end result was his family ended up despising and hating him. So the first thing that I deduced from that little bit of 
checking on dreams is that if dreams are from God, this would mean that was that something it was something that God was going to make happen. And so if they make sense to you, I would pray over them and I'd say, you know, God may, be, may warn you. God may, may have a reason for using a dream. And the second thing that I deduced was that Joseph's dreams especially would influence more than just himself. They would also affect his brothers, parents, and eventually his entire race, all of the Israelites. So they, this dream was only partly about Joseph. And that the dreams were telling Joseph, you're going to be used of, of God. That Joseph was a part of a larger plan. And through Joseph, God was going to bring the people of Israel down into Egypt, where I like to say they were like incubated. They, they were taken care of and nurtured. So for 400 years, they found favor with the pharaohs. 430 years later is when a particular pharaoh turned against them and made them become slaves. Now that, that was the good thing, the bad thing, the people of Israel would be isolated from the influence of other nations and other religions. And the, believe it or not, the Pharaoh gave them a really, really good part of Egyptian territory. It was called the land of Goshen. And it was a land that was extremely good for raising cattle. E Egyptians weren't real favorable to people who were farmers, cattle raisers. But by natural inclination, Israelites were sheep herders. And there's similarities between whether you herd sheep or you herd cattle. And the reason uh, that the Egyptians had an adversity to sheep herders and cattle people is because most of them were vegetarians. They weren't big meat eaters. And so the Egyptians really didn't want much to do with them socially. They said, you, you go to the land of Goshen, you do your thing. Leave us alone. And for 400 years, they prospered. They grew enormously. But because of Joseph and his ability to interpret the leader's dreams, the Pharaoh's dreams, they were extremely kind to his people for over 400 years. And we know that Israel grew into a mighty, mighty nation, a, a, a mighty people. They actually went from a family unit to two to four million people. That's a lot of people. Two to four million people. And they were able to pretty well do what they wanted to do and live peaceably. They were even protected by the armies of Egypt. Egypt at, at that time was probably the United States of America in its day. It was a powerful, powerful nation and had one of the strongest armies of that region. And so no other nation 
Even though they weren't always mighty, they were small and they, it took 400 years for them to become 2 to 4 million people. These nations couldn't attack them or kill them because they were under the protection. So God knew what he was doing. That's the point. This was an elaborate, long-time plan, but God knew exactly what he was doing, and he chose the right man for the job. And frankly, it was in Egypt where Israel becomes a unified people. They become the nation that they would eventually become and take the promised land. And I think probably the most unifying force, believe it or not, was the force of slavery. And they were unified in, by believing in the one true God. And so when Israel finally leaves Egypt, and it was by God's mighty hand that they left, they were prepared mentally and physically to return and take possession of the land God had promised them. And then God uses Abraham, who, who was a hundred at that time. And in a dream, cuts the covenant with, with Abraham, and eventually that covenant is the covenant that Israel lived by. And so all of this comes to pass because God gave Joseph a couple of dreams while he slept. If he can do that with Joseph, can he do it with us? Dreams are very powerful things. Particularly when it's God who gives them to us. Our nation, and you see plenty of indication as you read the history of the foundation of America, was founded on a dream. And I believe it was a dream that was given to us, our ancestors, by God. And in the second paragraph of the Dec Declaration of Independence, we're told of that dream. And that says the following, we, are, we hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal that they are endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. That, that actually is very similar to a psalm, Psalms 33, 12. And that psalm says, Blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord. And that's, that's as true today as it was when it was penned back then. And they believed that our nation was blessed. And that it should protect unalienable rights that their creator desired for them. Which were life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And then the preamble to the Constitution, and I find this fascinating, of the United States declared, we the people, in order to form a more perfect union, establish justice, ensure domestic tranquility, provide for the common defense, promote the general welfare, and secure the blessing of liberty to ourselves and our posterity, do ordain and establish this Constitution of the United States of America. 
seems strange that, that that's almost a stated divinely. And yet today, they don't want the children to pray in school. They don't want them to carry Bibles. They don't want a Christmas program. Isn't it odd that our leaders today almost are silent about what this nation was founded on? What, what our early founders were really saying is that our, na our nation's founders had a desire to form a more perfect union than man had ever considered. And they base it on God and the Bible. There was a desire to establish a nation based upon Christian principles. And they believed these Christian principles would bring about the establishment of justice, domestic tranquility, the basis for a common defense. I, I don't even understand what's happening today in America. I, I'm certainly not an advocate of slavery, but I don't understand how one group of people can arbitrarily decide all the monuments of America that had anything to do with the Civil War ought to be destroyed. Now you may say, well, because they went through as slaves a terrible, terrible time. The problem with that kind of behavior is, where do we stop? I mean, I mean, there, there, there are denominations that are pacifist. They don't believe in war of any kind. So, so do they have the right to say, well, you know what? We don't like the Marine Monument in Washington. So we're going to go over there and destroy it. We're pacifists. You may, you may say, well, that's ridiculous. Is it? I mean, where do we stop? Shortly after World War II, there was a whole movement that denied the Holocaust. Thousands and thousands of people said, oh, no, no. The eradication, the gassing, the cremation of Jews never happened. That was a horrible time for Israel. And yet Israel demanded that the places that did these horrible things should remain. People travel to Europe right now, and one of the things many of them do is to go through the Holocaust centers. They go through the prison camps that are still intact today. The crematoriums are still there. Not because it was a pleasant time for Israel, but they, they wanted the people the, to know and never forget what happened. That's six and a half million human beings, men, women, and children, were eradicated by another nation. So that our Constitution is the basis for a common defense. Even, even when the Japanese were interned illegally, You can go to some of these areas and the buildings have long, are long dilapidated. They, they, they're, they're, done, they're done. But there's monuments that have been raised up to show where these, in, these intern camps were. And so our Constitution was based to provide for the general welfare of every human being that would be raised in America. And to secure the blessings of God for the liberty for themselves and for those who came after them.
we were deliberately established and intended to be a nation established and to be under God. So we've been sold a bill of goods. Our politicians are trying to protect uh, America from so-called religion. That was never the intention of our forefathers. It was to protect religion from judicial law. We came over from England because England was tampering with religious rights and freedoms. That's why the pilgrims came here. So when left-wingers and liberals and politicians try to, to use laws wrongly, that's not right. Christian principles were interwoven in the very fabric of how our nation began. And we need to get back to that time. In one of the most famous speeches, Patrick Henry, the one who said, give me liberty or give me death, declared something and our nation's school textbooks pretty much ignore. And it's an appeal to arms, and the God of hosts is all that is left of us, but we shall not fight our battle alone. This is what he says. There is a just God that presides over the destinies of nations. The battle, sir, is not to the strong alone. Is life so dear or peace so sweet as to be purchased at the price of chains and slavery? Forbid it, almighty God, I know not what course others may take. And this is his famous saying, but as for me, give me liberty or give me death. We ought to thank God we had men like that and women like that. James Madison, the primary author of the Constitution of the United States, said this, We have staked the whole future of our new nation not upon the power of government. Far from it, we have staked the future of our political constitutions upon the capacity of each of ourselves to govern ourselves according to the moral principles of the Ten Commandments. They'd be voted out of office today. George Washington appealed to God while he was president. And so my alluding to what's happening in the South, so, it, so atheists could band together and say, well, we don't believe in God, we're going to tear Washington's monuments down. We, we have to be careful of the road we go down. This is, this is what he said. I, I just find this fascinating. And I think sometimes you say, what, why are you teaching on this? I think we ought to remember. You know, there's an old saying that says, those who forget the past are doomed to repeat it. What well, we need to understand, here's what George Washington said, Almighty God, we make our earnest prayer that thou will keep the United States in thy holy protection, that thou will incline the hearts of the citizens to cultivate a spirit, a spirit of subordination and obedience to government, and entertain a brotherly affection and love for one another and for their fellow citizens of the United States at large. 
And finally, that thou wilt most graciously be pleased to dispose us all to do justice, to love, mercy, and to demean ourselves with a charity, humility, and, and specifically temper of mind, which were the characteristics of the divine author of our blessed religion. And without a humble, humble imitation of whose examples in these things we can never hope to be a happy nation. Grant our supplication, we beseech thee through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Can you imagine a president getting up on TV and praying a prayer like that? They would impeach him. It was the intention, intention of our founding fathers to weave into our nation biblical principles. How do they, how do they intend to do that? First, they deliberately acknowledge God through founding documents. You can go back in the founding documents of America and see God splashed all over the pages. There's a, there's a, you, see, you hear it on all the fundamental radio programs. They talk about a college called Hillside. It's in Michigan. And they call the Declaration of Independence a most remarkable declaration and it's really a beautiful thing if you put the four places that God has mentioned together in the Declaration. He's mentioned as the maker of the laws of nature, what makes, which makes him a legislator. He's mentioned as the supreme judge of the world. Our... our, our um, Politicians don't even mention this, what I'm talking about tonight. What politician have you heard get up on TV and share what I'm sharing tonight? So he's mentioned as the supreme judge of the world, which makes him a judge. He's mentioned as divine providence, which makes him an executive. And he's mentioned as the creator which is like being a founder. I, I was reading, before we, I came over here tonight, I was reading uh, on, the, on the founding of the world, of earth. And those who don't believe in God believe that life emanated from the ocean. Moses, in his writings, says it emanated from the land. And, and there's a whole debate. There's, you know, it, it's taught as fact in our schools. And yet the one who originated that on his deathbed renounced it. But nobody, nobody corrects it. Nobody says, Well, that isn't, that isn't right. Abortion. The law that, that brought abortion, abortion into fact and, and was established on the woman at that time, that woman now is a Christian. She's renounced it and has become born again. But I, I, I don't think I've heard a politician get up and say, Roe versus Wade is, is phony now because what it was established on, she now has renounced it, recounted it, and has made Jesus Christ her Lord and Savior. The Declaration of In Independence is nothing more than an appeal to heaven. 
When you really get down to its principles, it's an appeal to heaven. Our, our nation's founders realized they could not make a lasting nation if God wasn't in it or behind it. And once the Declaration of Independence was signed, the original document ordered that the copies of the Declaration be sent first not to town clerks or newspapers, but to a parish minister who was required to read the same document to their respective congregations. As soon as divine service ended in the afternoon on the first Lord's Day, after they had received it. Can you imagine establishing this as a legal document, sending it out to the churches, and then I'm getting up and I preach on it, the first Sunday after it was declared and written. The Declaration of Independence was a document dedicated to God. And it was a document to be given first to those who worshipped God. So first our founders deliberately acknowledged God throughout their founding documents Second, they deliberately based their laws upon the Bible. I don't know how everything got so mixed up and lost. See, Europe, Europe wasn't based on what we based our declarations on. It was strictly legal documents, and that's what they didn't want. When our nation was founded, it could have chosen any of Europe's legal system. They wanted no part of it. And being from the British Empire, they could have simply copied English laws. They didn't do that. Because the legal system of England was part of what they were, had rebelled against. So instead they turned to an English legal scholar by the name of Sir William Blackstone. Blackstone's commentaries literally became the Bible of American jurisprudence. All of our nation's original legal thinking was based almost exclusively on Blackstone. What made Blackstone's legal commentary so unique was that he quoted extensively from the Bible. If he set forth a legal principle, he used scripture to justify it. You couldn't be a lawyer in America at that time without knowing and understanding scripture. And repeatedly our founding fathers quoted from the Bible. They often spoke of the power and majesty of God. Many prayed for Christ to bless our nation. Isn't there something in our Constitution or in one of our nation's original documents that says something about the separation of church and state? That's what I was alluding to. They, they've made that, totally misrepresenting it. It was, to, it was to protect our religious rights from interference from a, a nation, from the legalities of a nation. It, it wasn't to protect the nation. It was to protect religion. And to be honest with you, and you hear politicians saying this all the time, those words aren't anywhere in our nation's founding documents. What they were written, they were written by a man by the name of Thomas Jefferson. You remember him. 
He was the principal author of the Declaration of Independence and became our nation's third president. In 1802, the Danbury Baptist Church expressed concern that our nation was on the verge of creating a national church denomination, such as many of the nations in Europe had done. Jefferson wrote them a letter clarifying that this could never happen because America had built a wall of separation between church and state that forbade our nation from imposing its will upon the churches of our country. And yet they're, they're doing that very thing now. And people think, say, well, Jefferson wasn't a believer. He was. He, he signed, when he was president, he signed legislation that gave land to Indian missionaries. It doesn't sound like he was an unbeliever to me. He, asked, he actually authorized at least one congregation to worship in the treasury building. He put chaplains on the government payroll, paid for the construction of at least one church building using government money. Again, he would be impeached today. And those that quote Jefferson either don't understand what he meant or they don't care. But the point is clear. Even Jefferson believed his nation should be based upon biblical teachings. Does that mean America is a Christian nation? No, not necessarily. Only an individual can be a Christian. But we ought to thank God that we got that opportunity. I, I was in the largest chapel on Monday at Rose Hill. I gave an altar call. And I don't know how many people there, but a lot confessed Jesus as their personal Savior. My fear as a pastor is the time quickly coming when the government says, you can't do that anymore. Because there are people that that offends. And you know, a lot of people say, you're being foolish, Pastor Gary. Am I really? When did we ever think that any group of people could go through our nation Tearing down whatever they want to tear down. And, and by the way, I hate slavery. I despise it. I'm, I'm from Missouri. They're, they're, it's full of insensitive people who still use the N-word. And I despise it. But where are we going to stop? When, when does it become fashionable? Well, Somebody in the nation doesn't like that, so we're going to eradicate everything. Only an individual is a Christian. Only an individual repents of their sins. Only an individual can confess Jesus as their master. Only an individual can be buried in water baptism with Jesus. A nation can't do those things and shouldn't, shouldn't do those things. However, a nation can be blessed if it has a large number of people who believe. 
And it can be really blessed if its rulers and laws are guided by Christian principles. That, that's my whole point in sharing this tonight. Our nation needs to repent. Even, even Chief Justice Earl Warren, who was a real liberal, said that the history of our country and the document's character exhibit the same objective, a Christian land governed by Christian principles. A nation to be Christian presumes that a nation will give glory to Christ. And America has not always done that. I think, as I close tonight, I, I, I love history, and I, I look at the history of World War II, and, I, and I'll watch these documentaries, and, and I say to myself, God, how do we win the war? When, when, you, when you look at the might of a... Nazi Germany, you look at the super weapons, just, just their tank cores. And we produce thousands and thousands of tanks, but their weapons were so powerful that I, I used to, you know, I'd sit and, and weep when I'd see, because 18, 19 year old boys were in these tanks and they're being blown to pieces just burning up. I, I had a friend, I grew up with my dad's friend, who was a tanker. And he talked about how they had to, a device that they turned backwards because there were so many dead American tankers on the ground that in order to get away from the German guns, they literally were running over them with, with our tanks. And I said to myself, how do we win the war? I mean, you just boom, 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 tank after tank after tank. Then, it, then finally, you know, stupid me, I said, we won the war because we were a praying nation. We, we were a nation that served God. God divinely intervened. And I truly believe that. I, I believe that the nation we once were was because we honored God. We honored him in our schools. We honored him in, in the public arenas. I, I believe we won the war because of the churches. I remember reading a story, there was a, a small town. And this particular church in that small town prayed for every man who was drafted and went into World War II, and every one of them came back. Every one of them. And I don't think it was just an accident. I think God honored that. I think America's greatness is based on America's churches. I think America is great because I think basically at heart America is good. I, I really do. At the heart of America, I think basically it's good. It feeds people. It, I mean, we, we fought a war in World War II, and it so devastated Europe those people would have starved to death. Many of you don't, rem don't even know who this guy is, but his name was Marshall. And Harry Truman told him, come up with a Marshall plan. And what that Marshall plan was is that we fed 
They destroyed Europe in World War II. We fed, after, after Germany did all the things they did and killed all the people that they killed, we fed them. We fed their people. And God honored that. I, I believe that. And as long as America is good, I believe America will be great. And if it ever ceases to be good, it will cease to be great. America is great because God placed a dream into the souls of our nation's founders. And I thought the same, when I look at history and the war that we fought with England, I said, how did we win this? How did we ever win this? I mean, there were times that George Washington was down to a couple of 3,000 people. And they wanted to go home. I think that we need to demand accountability from our leaders and say, how come, how come you never talk about this? You say, well, what purpose does this have? I think, I think believers ought to know the truth about what's not being told by the politicians of today. I mean, nothing's getting done in Washington. The Democrats and the Republicans are at war with each other. We, we, ought, to, we ought to demand a ceasefire. We ought to man, demand that things change. I mean, talk about fake news. That's our president. It is fake news. Now, you know, they, they, couldn't, they couldn't pin anything about Russia. They couldn't pin anything about this. Now, now the big thing is our president is incapacitated. He's mentally ill. We ought to put a stop to this. Um, uh, churches should flood... CNN and say, you know what, we're going to quit buying your products if you don't stop this nonsense. Because eventually it's going to affect our churches, America, altar calls. Am I, am I going to be forced someday by government? You will marry that group of people or you can't be a, a pastor. I mean, what are we going to do? Are, are we not going to tithe because the government is going to say to us, we will not give you credit for your tithes? I mean, that's the reason we tithe is because we get tax credit. We tithe because God says we ought to tithe. The reason I, I brought this tonight is I want us to know what we're headed for. And that we have a right to make our leaders responsible and accountable. And we, we need to think, and we need, don't need to be voting because our Republican, Independent, or Democrat. We need to be voting the way God would have us to vote because we've checked their records and we know they're godly men and godly women. I hope I didn't bore you tonight. I, I just, I just, I don't know. I, I have had this for a long time and I thought, I, I just need to bring to the church what the truth is about our founding.